This is the Movement 101 Podcast. How's it going, guys? You're very welcome to today's podcast. It is just myself, Rob, here on my own. No guest, no Brian. And, and I have a particular subject that I want to talk about. Okay, so before I introduce the subject, the reason I'm talking about this is I've changed my attitudes and my beliefs towards this subject. Um, and it's been massively, massively beneficial and indeed surprising uh, for myself, but massively beneficial for my life. So whilst I've posted about it a few times, you know, there's a lot in it. Uh, you're going to need an open mind. Um, but yeah, I just, I feel compelled to, to share, share this. Okay. Um, so the subject we are talking about today is alcohol. And about four years ago, I made the decision to just go for 90 days alcohol free. It was a challenge that I saw, <clears throat> which appealed to me. Okay, and four years later, that, that 90 days, whilst I do drink occasionally, I'm not like completely teetotal, but I have drank like less in the last four years than I would have on, a, let's say, a two-week holiday with, with a few of my mates or even even a weekend, some weekends when, when, I, when I look back in my 20s. So, yeah, alcohol is an interesting, an interesting subject, you know, for Irish people. Uh, or people in, in this kind of neck of the woods uh, worldwide. It, it is interesting how it impacts upon us, how it's taken as, as, as for granted almost, how it's a huge part of our culture, okay? So, so yes, at the time I was training pretty well. Uh, I was in decent shape. I wasn't drinking a lot, you know, once a week maybe. Um, but when I saw the challenge... Uh, questions came up, okay, the um, the questions that came up, I'm going to ask you and I asked myself and I, I've taken some time and consideration to answer these questions. Um, so you could pause this uh, podcast if you wanted to make it interactive, ask yourself these questions, um, but these really helped me in, in understanding, I suppose, how what kind of role alcohol was playing in my life. So question number one. Why do I drink? If you drink alcohol, why do you drink alcohol? And I'll give, I'll give you my answer in, in a few moments. Question number two, is alcohol enhancing my life? These are the questions that I asked before I took the, the challenge, okay? Is alcohol enhancing my life? And one more, okay, there's a couple more, but one more for, the, for now. What is the longest I have lived alcohol-free? in my adult life. Okay, so if you want to pause this, write this down, think about this, I think it's worthwhile um, or even considering it, even for, even for a few moments. But I'll give you the top two reasons why I drank and why I was drinking at this time. And again, it was four years ago, I was 40 years of age uh, by the time I took this challenge. And I'm not sure which is number one or number two, so it doesn't really matter, I suppose, but one of the main reasons I was drinking alcohol is because I'm Irish. I'm an Irishman living in Ireland, right? My nationality, okay? That's one of the main reasons I was drinking uh, alcohol. I believe the other reason that is in the top two is it was an ingrained habit, okay? Uh, typically, we, we start drinking here in Ireland, well, mid to late teens, um, so 15, 16, 17 onwards. So if you go from 15 to 40, that's quarter of a century, right? That, that I was consuming alcohol regularly. All right. More like 16, 17, you got it definitely got into a lot, lots, uh, well, you could get into pubs when you're 18. Um, I used to do a few fake IDs back in the day. I'll, I'll, I'll admit, you know, I was a kid, so I don't think they can get me on that now, but yeah, over 22 years, 22 to 25 years, in and about a quarter of a century, I was consuming the drug of alcohol at least once a week, um, twice a week, probably be a better average. I consider holidays with the mates in my 20s, partying, um, 
uh, J1s, you know, traveling around Australia. And the, there was times there, there was a hell of a lot more than once or twice a week, you know, but a seriously ingrained habit. So they're the top two reasons um, I was drinking. All right. And if you think about an ingrained habit, just to just to kind of clarify this uh, or, or to help you, you think about it. I, I want to give a couple of examples of, of an ingrained habit. I was driving my kids there to the playground a few, uh, a few a little while ago, and they're like, "Dad, where are you going?" Oh, sorry, I was on the way to work. I I just taken that route to work in my brain. That was kind of automatic. Get in the car, leave, take this direction because this is my my way to work. You may have done something similar. Uh, another example. Of, so it's automatic, you know. Another example of uh, an ingrained habit. Uh, just last week, we had a little bit of a power outage. Um, so the kids are in bed, myself and wife lit some candles. It's quite nice, actually. Um, but I went to the bathroom with the torch on my phone on. Okay, And as I, as I went into the bathroom, I turned on the light. I knew there was no electricity, but that just, that reach and turn on the light, it's just automatic. My brain is in this position, ingrained habit, I'm going to turn on the, on the light. Um, so, yeah. <clears throat> There are two reasons why I drank. Why I drank. <coughs> and they're kind of strange enough reasons to take a, a drug that does a lot of damage, okay? It doesn't have to do a lot of damage, of course. Um, but my nationality and, and just a habit that I've ingrained since I was a child, you know, before I was an adult. Um, so, yeah, I, I found that very interesting, you know, when doing this challenge. Uh, and the whole idea of the challenge was to examine and understand my relationship around alcohol and indeed change it. And I wasn't a problem drinker. That's not to say alcohol didn't cause me problems in my past, okay? Uh, very few of us out there um, ha have gone through life up to my age anyway without alcohol causing some problems here and there. So yeah, so there's the, there's the three questions. The longest I have lived without alcohol. Sorry, I didn't mention that one. As an adult... You know, I know some people do like the um, sober November or dry January or something like that. Uh, I don't I don't remember doing either of them. Uh, I would say two or three weeks, maybe, maybe four weeks. I don't remember doing four weeks. So, you know, I hadn't lived alcohol free really for any decent amount of time until maybe I was like 15. You know, that was the last time, you know, so quarter of a century and it was, it, I was a kid, really, the last time I lived any amount of time with alcohol not being in my life, you know. That is, that kind of spoke to me. That is like, hey, you need to do this 90 challenge or you're going to benefit from this 90-day challenge. And it's only 90 days, you know. What, what, uh, what do I have to lose, okay? It's not like I'm committing to uh, never drinking again. So, so I did the challenge. Um... One year no beer. If I haven't mentioned them, you can Google them. There's a couple of lads there. Uh, they set this up. Uh, Andy Ramage, Rory Parsons, a couple of great guys. Um, and they have a whole community there. They, they've gotten in some great people to help in terms of behavioral scientists and stuff like this. I haven't, I I think I'm still in their, their Facebook group. I, I probably muted them. I don't, you know, but that's what they have. They help people through this. And I'll talk a little bit about, you know, uh, I wasn't a problem drinker like I mentioned a moment ago some people obviously in this group would be and they need that support but even without that the support at the start and some of the cues and some of the tips were, 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 were very helpful um, but yeah I had a bit of a false start a couple of times as in I got the, uh, I got the uh, literature the emails um, they have a website, and there's, you know, they, they I can't remember, it was four years ago, but they take you through, I think there was an email a day for two weeks or something like that. Um, but, for example, I went to the pub once when I decided to start this, and I didn't really tell anybody, and the bartender comes over and says, what are you having? A pint of X, and I, I don't even want to mention the, the alcohol brand, um, but it was automatic. I, I, I actually went, uh, uh, a pint of whatever beer it was. Because uh, I didn't know what to say. I wasn't prepared. Again, it's a bit like the light switch stuff. Uh, but anyway, they give you some tools in terms of alcohol-free beers, uh, how to how to address it with your friends. I mean, my friends are cool. <laughs> there was no problem. Um, but I understand, and I've ex I have experienced a few times where someone's like, ah, have a drink. You know, go on, have a drink. 
No, I'm actually not drinking uh, at the moment. What? Go on, have a drink. Have a, you know, this this happens. It didn't affect me massively because I don't have an issue with it. It could affect other people who are trying to drink, uh, stop drinking because they know it's detrimental to their mental health and, and what have you. Wasn't an issue for me. Anyway, I'll, I'll go through the 90 days. <clears throat> First 30 days, great. Um, no problems. Wasn't missing it. Uh, I was also going out. I, I went to parties. I, I wasn't like, I wasn't locking myself away like some people might do in a sober November where they know they're going out on Christmas. They're not, they're not going to spend a whole lot of money at Christmas, you know, when pubs and stuff are open. Not at the moment, of course. But I was living. I wasn't just locking myself away. And what happens with some people when they take like a sober November or a dry January, they don't go out, they don't see their friends, they don't socialize, they don't have any inverted commas fun. Uh, and then they associate that with not drinking. When you can go out, you're allowed to go out and have fun without consuming alcohol. It, it's, it is allowed. Um, it's just not common, very common in, in, in certain age groups in, in this country. Um, and a lot of the majority of age groups really. So anyway, 90 days had passed. I was feeling better. Uh, again, I was training and working in the gym, doing spins, and I was training hard at the time. I was feeling good, energetic, and I didn't miss it. You know, it was like, I missed it like a hangover. You know, you just, I wasn't missing it. And um, so I said, you know what? I'll do another month. Uh, so I did another month and another. Anyway, nine months later, um, nine months later, and I was feeling great. Uh, myself and my wife went out for a meal and I said, you know what? And I was been I've been hemming and hawing about this for a while. I was I was glad I was glad to get the nine months. It felt like I've achieved something. I I'd really felt like I had an insight into my drinking in, in the past. And I said, you know what, I'll, I'll have a couple of glasses of wine. We're gonna have a nice meal. I'm gonna have a couple of glasses of wine. And I remember it. It was a it was a nice restaurant in town, um, expensive restaurant, and I got the most I, I didn't want to drink a bottle. Um, so I got two glasses of their most expensive red. It was a Malbec, you know, and I, I did enjoy my wine at one stage. And halfway through the first glass, you know, with a nice steak, this is this is nice, you know, this is good. And you get the buzz straight away. It's a good 14 and a half, 15 percent, 15 percent wine. Um, <clears throat> honestly, towards the end of that glass, it's like, yeah, that was nice, but drank the second glass and already I was feeling what I now understand was it was just an anticlimax. You know, I was building this up. I had the two glasses of wine. We had a meal. We enjoyed ourselves. But afterwards, I was like, it doesn't taste quite as nice as I remembered it or as I imagined it to be. Um, a bit like looking back with rose tinted glasses. Uh I didn't feel as good as I thought I would. I had a bit of a buzz. You might say, well, you only had two glasses of wine. Honestly, if you haven't drank for nine months, two big glasses of 14.5% red wine, you know, for someone my size, it, it, it's, it, it was pretty significant, you know, because your tolerance can't, does go down. Um, the next day, I wasn't dying of a hangover at all, but I had a hangover. You know, I didn't get a good night's sleep. It's, you just can't do it uh, with alcohol. Uh, I was a little bit dehydrated, even though I drank plenty of water on the way home. But I just didn't feel myself, even the lining of my stomach, uh, just all, all day. It was like, and I was, I was surprised saying to my wife, like, jeepers, that, that really wasn't worth it, you know, even though it was only a couple of glasses of wine. So I went off it again. And this would happen, I would basically go three or four months without drinking, have one or two anticlimax, three or four months without drinking, have one or two anticlimax. And... Basically, in the last four years, that's been it. Again, I haven't completely uh, banned myself from doing drinking alcohol, but I just don't feel like drinking anymore. And I don't feel like I can enjoy it. I feel it's massively overrated. This is from myself. This is from my experience. Okay, I feel it's massively overrated, and yeah, it's 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 massively surprised me. You know, if if I'd have been listening to this podcast. In my early 20s, hey, I wouldn't be listening right now. I probably would have turned it off. I, I was closed-minded, you know, and it's... Um, um, I'm not saying everybody's going to be like that in their 20s. Um, I think it's a sign of intelligence or, or, or something if you can learn from other people's experiences rather than having to learn the hard way all the time. Yeah, that, that, that's pretty much how it started, you know, originally 90 days Basically, in the course of a year, I, I drank a couple of glasses of wine. And in the last four years, you know, I've, I've drank so little, I, um, it's, it's, it's almost insignificant. 
you know, one reason that I'm not saying never, um, you know, is just, just to have that option there if I want, okay? Uh, and if I could just go over some upsides of drinking alcohol-free. I'll go into some upsides, I'll go into some downsides, and we'll talk a little bit about the culture and about advertising and, and a, a few things, okay? Um, but I think this is quite, when you put it down on paper or, or when you think about it, it's quite like profound, but a few benefits that I found. You get better sleep. As I mentioned a m moment ago, you can't really get into that deep restorative, I think it's REM, rapid eye movement sleep, when there's alcohol in your system. Your liver is you know, working overtime to metabolize that stuff. So you get better sleep, which means you have more energy, which means you have improved cognitive function. You make better decisions, all right? Um, anyone suffers with anxiety, your anxiety is reduced. When you drink, you know, anxiety is a, is a, is a, can be a, a result of it. You improve your mental health. You don't have any hangovers. Never again. Have you, have you ever said that? If you're in Ireland, you, you've probably said that. I've said that on many occasions. You increase your life expectancy. You reduce your risk of numerous cancers. If you're interested in training, you improve your uh, recovery time, right? Uh, because you're, you're better hydrated. Um, again, I mentioned you think clear and it, it felt like there's a fog lifting. Even if you're only drinking once a week, all right? There's more focus. You're making better decisions. You, you, you're, you're thinking clear. Improved relationships was one. You know, I, I just thinking back myself and my wife laughed about it, but you know, we've had a few arguments on holidays. This is before kids. We can remember one or two where we just we we're in a, we went down. We we got drunk. We had a drunken argument. It's just over stupid stuff. It's just like a waste of time. But I would also say I it, it enables me to be a better parent. Okay, more patient. All right. Like four years ago, um, I had. Uh, my my eldest daughter would have been six, uh, and I had a one year old, my, my youngest daughter. All right, so a six year old and a one year old, you wake up with a banging hangover. You have to go through all day Sunday with a banging hangover, and they're like, "Daddy, daddy, can we do this? Can we do that, daddy?" And they're they're making noise and what what have you. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't be as patient. I would be my my ability to be a good parent is massively uh, affected by being hungover. Right, it just is, you know, hundred percent. I still lose patience with them now. Okay, I love them to bits. Uh, so yeah, for me to be a better parent, I'm better off not drinking. And I think, you know, I, I'm sure there's brilliant parents out there who drink all the time. I, I'm not here to judge or to preach. I'm just sharing my experience. Right, um, empowerment. I don't have to follow the herd here. Right, I was following the herd for a long time. I was consuming this dangerous drug addictive drug, overrated drug for a quarter of a century without even really think about it because, again, it's, it's that herd kind of mentality, you know? And fun. I've had lo loads of fun without alcohol. Like, there's, it's a mistake to think that you need alcohol to have fun, and, and that sounds pretty obvious, but I had great fun when I was a kid. Some of the most fun things I've done, even as an adult, don't involve alcohol. Okay, you can get... I bunch you together and boisterous and have fun in, at weddings and, and 21st and what have you. Um, but the real fun things are kind of done outside of the, the nights out, I believe. You know, I've been to stags where we would have an event, you know, you'd do something like clay pigeon shooting or, or whatever, you know, and they you'd have more fun on that. You'd have a laugh in the night, of course you would, but they're the, more the things you remember, actually, especially at stags, you know. I... I I've forgotten a lot about what happens after a certain time on stags and nights out, you know. So there's a few of the upsides of alcohol. Um, I'm drinking here a, a supplement. I was just having a, um, having a chat with, with Dan here before, and it's essential amino acids. It's just something that I'm dropping a bit of body fat at the moment, and it was something that was recommended to me. But, like, if I told you, right, hey, I got a supplement here that you might want to wanna, wanna take, what is it? Well, what does it improve? You get better sleep, more energy. It, it will help you um, uh, become leaner. You'll reduce anxiety. You know, you're going to make better decisions, better hydration, think clear. You, it'll improve your relationship. Uh, you'll you'll, you'll uh, feel empowered. Um, and you'll, how much is it? No, you'll save a ton of cash on it as well, right? That, that supplement will be, uh, you know, you could charge what you wanted for it. You know, a lot of people out here are looking at supplements. What's your alcohol intake like, okay? 
you can certainly be strong, fit, uh, consuming alcohol in a moderate level. I understand that, and I've done that. You know, when I was doing this at the time, I, initially four years ago, I was fit, I was getting lean, and I was having my my cheat, probably not the best way to to frame it, but my my cheat meal once a week was half a bottle of wine and a bar of chocolate. This one was dro- dropping body fat four years ago, and um, just just at a certain stage of my training, uh, and I looked forward to that. But anyway, there's a few upsides of going alcohol free. All right. Now, why don't we just lead straight into a few downsides? How am I for time there? Not bad. Hangovers, anxiety, fear, weight gain, compliance. I'll talk about compliance now in a minute. Doing stupid shit, right? Steve Coogan, aka Alan Partridge, he gave up alcohol. I, I just I heard this on on, on, on something, but um when he was asked, why did you give up drinking, Steve? Uh, and he, he just said, I got tired of waking up in a skip, okay? And I can relate. I've never woken up in a skip, but, you know, I can relate. Um, doing dangerous things. Uh, people do dangerous things. I've done dangerous things. I've gotten away with stuff. Not everyone gets away with, with stuff. Um, cancer, all right? It is alcohol is contributes to mouth and pharynx cancer, larynx cancer, esophagus, breast, liver, stomach, bowel, okay? Uh, it doesn't have smoking in there, or it doesn't have lung cancer in there. I know a lot of people only smoke when they drink, but that's not in there. Um, <clears throat> there's probably more, you know, th- th- I did a bit of research on this. Mental health, there is a huge, uh, at the moment, there is, and for the last few years, there, there's really been a focus on men- mental health in press, in media, and, and it's, it's good to see. Um, but it's associated with increased self-harm and suicide. I am a man over 40. I'm 44. And young men, okay, suicide is affecting young men. I just came across this one stat, uh, okay. For 40-year-old men who committed suicide, 40-year-old plus men, men over 40 who committed suicide, 76.5% had a history of alcohol abuse. You know, that's... uh, that struck me, okay. Um, A&E, it's different at the moment during lockdown, but talk to someone who's worked in a, A&E. I've talked to some doctors who, who've worked in an a, A&E. Uh, I know, um, talk to some nurses who've worked in A&E. I don't have the figures there, but it's in the in the billions that it costs the Irish economy every every year, every year, every year, right? So, so that's... There's a few alcohol downsides, okay? I'm not asking for alcohol to be banned. I'm just sharing my experience, but it, I think it's worth, like, um, just looking at it. And then, you know, what do you mean you're giving up alcohol? Are you all right? You know, it, it's, uh, yeah, I feel great for it, okay? Um, so, yeah, I, I did touch on it earlier on, but, like, culture, right? Like, what is culture when you think of it? And it's, it's just what a group of people do. Um, and I, I look at culture when, when I was thinking of this uh, and it struck me that culture is something that's normal to people in that culture but can seem strange to people outside of that culture. So if I was to look at, you know, somewhere different in the world where uh, they wear different clothes, they have a different religion, actually they don't drink alcohol, you know, that culture can look strange because, but it's just alien to us. But to those millions of people living there, that's that's normal for them, okay? So by doing that, I, can we take ourselves out of our culture? I talked a moment about following the herd. So if you, if you use this, and I did say, you, you know, you might need an open mind to think about what I'm talking about here. But could you take your, if you are Irish or or, or you know, possibly British, Northern European, listen to this, or even Australian, American, whatever, could you take yourself out of your culture and put yourself in neutral culture and just look down and look at this? And, you know, I've worked in bars, uh, a hotel, bar, restaurants abroad and that. Um, and we have a thing here in Dublin, the Nightlink. I've gotten a Nightlink home sober a few times, sat upstairs, big mistake. You know, you walk into a a, a chipper at 3 a.m. off of Connell Street uh, sober and your eyes 
you know, will open up. You're walking drunk, you know, your guard is down, you, you, uh, your behavior is different. Remember, alcohol is a, is a mind-altering drug, all right? Uh, you, you will do things drunk. People do things drunk that they would never dream of doing uh, sober, all right? All sorts of things. There's a horrible... Uh, a horrible story going on at the news at the moment, you'll be listening to this, but it, it happened a few years ago where basically, you know, a group of young people, and this is, you know, life's, life's unforgiving in many ways. I got away with some stuff, you know, drinking, you know, I, I, but we don't get away with everything. And, and this guy, I think he was 20, 21, drunk, a few people in the car crashed. People died, all right, his, his, his best friends. On a night out, people died, people were badly injured, uh, lives altered beyond repair, you know, from a drunken night out. Um, this stuff happens, you know. So, yeah, culture, culturally, you know, we have to understand, whilst it's normal for us, we in Ireland drink, drink an extreme level, right? We are on, we are up there in the top nations of the world, and some nations don't drink at all. We're at the top. And even over the last 40 years since I was born, you know, sometimes we relate culture with something that's old, our drinking has gone up like 30 something percent or 30 or 40 percent. I've saw that stat looking it up. I didn't write it down, but it was it was marked. All right. And I actually think about that going back to the 80s. And, you know, there wasn't, you know, in my local uh, village, um, there wasn't like wine only off off licenses. Uh, wine wasn't a big deal back then. Now you can get wine from all over the world in a petrol station. Right. It, it's it, it, things have changed. It's so more, much more available and everything. Um. So, yeah. When you look at the culture, every, drinking is just normal. Whether you're at like you know a wedding, a funeral, a christening, uh, a Saturday night out, um, uh, watching a rugby, uh, what whatever. Uh, when I talk about the rugby, yeah, I wanted to mention this. You see, alcohol companies and the advertising. I look at the advertising now differently having lived alcohol free maybe i'm a bit of a cynic but a lot of us are aware of what's going on with like data uh our data in terms of the big corporations the googles the the, the facebook's you know targeting us um algorithms and that you know so it's it's we're, we're, we're way beyond guinness is good for you with regards to alcohol advertising all right um, so look, they weren't always honest, but it's it's just interesting. I find it interesting the the dynamic around um, multi billion dollar companies um, targeting people and targeting people under eighteen. They want to get them drinking their product, uh, targeting them, and their their product causes cancer. Their product causes mental health issues. Their product is closely linked with high. Uh, suicide rates. I'm not looking for to ban alcohol, 100% not. But it just is interesting the way it's treated differently to a, every other drug, even when it's mentioned. Drugs and alcohol. Right? No one just says drugs. It's drugs and alcohol. Because because why? Because alcohol is legal? I'm not too sure. I found my life has been massively enhanced by not drinking alcohol. Okay, but, And there's a few things that people associated with it and one of them is sports you know and it, it's it's I can see alcohol actually it almost takes over the drinking takes over the event you know uh, are we going to a rugby match or are we going to the, on the piss okay now I've been to a mates there we, we got tickets to Ireland England a few years ago they are all drinking that was grand we went to a dinner beforehand and uh, pints afterwards I didn't drink at all and I really enjoyed it you know um, I've been to a Leinster game and same kind of thing we were late in because people were drinking pints we left early at half time to drink pints late in again it was like are we going to are we watching the rugby or are we fucking drinking here lads can we can we, can we get into the bloody game you know uh, and my eyes were open that day because I remember just going out and it was over in the RDS and just the, the, the little the little bars there, the little things, they just have like, you know, hundreds of pre-ready pints and plastic glasses that were like, I don't know, six, seven quid or something, something overpriced like that. Uh, it's, it's just like, is it, what are we doing here? You know, and that's just associated, you know, and, and it's the, the, the companies, like when you look at rugby, Heineken Cup, 
uh, Guinness Premiership, Guinness Six Nations, uh, Style Lager used to be on New Zealand's jersey. It, they they just uh, the the alcohol companies want to associate with these sports and many other sports. They need to, right, to get get to for sales. It makes sense to them uh, money wise. But yeah, I was at the New Zealand Ireland game in twenty eighteen. I think this is a really good example. It was a we'd beaten them only once before, and that was in Chicago. Right for non-rugby fans, all right. We'd never beaten them in Ireland. We've come close, uh, especially I think it was a few years before, about four or five five years before, we'd come very close, but we'd never beaten them. So they're coming over here. I think they're world champions, number one in the world. Ireland were playing really well at the time that year, and we knew we had a chance, and they knew it as, as well. They they were coming over here making different noises. They kind of always kind of took it for granted they're going to beat Ireland, but now things are a little bit different, okay? So anyway, it was with Joe Schmidt. We played out of our skin and we beat them. And I actually, we scored one try. I can't remember. It was just before half time or just after half time. Might have been just after half time, but we scored one try and it was, it was a sight to behold. And I kind of had a feeling, hey, this is a good position here. And I actually recorded, I posted it. I might actually repost it again here. Um, but I was, we were behind where the try was scored. Um, oh, I forget the guy's name. Scored. Guy from uh, Place for Ulster. Big young winger. But anyway, it was an amazing move. Line out, down to the scrum half, out to Sexton. He, a kind of a switch back. Uh, chip over the top. They dragged their winger away. That, that left the, the, like the smallest opening, these fine margins. Caught the ball, just going over the line, scored a try. Fifty thousand people went absolutely mental. It was, it was just the roar. I'll never forget it. And again, I record it. I'll pop it up because I'm screaming my head off myself. Um, are we here to watch the rugby? We're going to drink pints. The two lads in front of me, they're out getting pints. Two each, you know. The two lads beside me, I was with my mate of mine, but two lads beside us as well, they're out getting pints. Cuan, they've missed it. Never again will they have the chance to experience that moment? And it's just a moment. And the moment is, and that's what I love about sport, it was like, hey, in that moment you think, jeepers, we're, we could win the fucking World Cup next year. All right, we, <laughs> rugby fans will know what happened, but in that moment, just that bloody hell, fair play, lads. It was just, it was just a great moment for the team, no doubt, for everybody there. Uh, it was absolute, it was, so, it was massively memorable, um, unless you're out getting a beer you know and, and it, that just kind of it, it was just I've seen that a lot with rugby and with other things you know the alcohol companies the ads are just I see them as bullshit I really do of course they're bullshit why do they spend need to spend so much much money advertising alcohol and you might say uh, competing against a competition but I think it's more than that the fact that we've we're drinking 30, 40% more now than we were 40 years ago in a country that drank a lot 40 years ago shows that they're, they're, they're driving this consumption. Of course they are. It's for profits, all right? Um, and it's at, it's, at, it's at our nation's health, really. At society's health, if, if you look at it in, 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 that, uh, in that direction. Not, again, I don't think it should be... They should ban alcohol... You know, there was a chance to ban alcohol in advertising with regards to sports because essentially they're tar targeting children. Uh, the government didn't do it, though. You know, they're, they're, they're powerful. The alcohol companies are powerful. A few years ago, just to go on to advertising a little bit more. And again, alcohol doesn't taste good to me anymore. You know, when you started drinking, it didn't taste good to you probably either. That's why a lot of like teenagers drink like cider. It's it's sweeter. All those alcohol pops have come and po come popular over the last few years. Um, but I remember drinking and not liking the taste of it and trying trying to pour a bit of it away. But you, you acquire the taste through hard work, all right. And it goes up the the higher percentage of, of alcohol. Probably the worse it tastes, up to like your 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 vodkas and your whiskeys and, and what have you at forty percent, all right. But yeah. Whiskey. Does whiskey taste nice? Now, some connoisseurs would come on and argue with it. And guarantee if they took nine months off and tried it, um, they wouldn't find it so nice. But, yeah, walking through Dublin Airport, I, I saw an advert for alcohol, and it was taste, that's why. All right? And I, I laughed at the time. I literally laughed out loud. And it was like 8 o'clock in the morning, and there was a lady there 
with small little glass of whiskey. Would you like to try some whiskey, sir? I said, are you f No, I didn't. I just said, no, thanks. But are you joking me? Yo, yeah, yeah, I'd love to try some like um, straight whiskey at, at 8 a.m., you know? And actually, that taste, that's why. That kind of like, that was my kind of, you know, the illusion kind of of alcohol, of the advertising, of it in a culture was kind of stripped away. I feel like I, I see behind a magician, magician's curtain. I'm like, you are kidding me. If you can put that sign up there and people are walking by, you know, oh yeah, taste that, that's, that's a nice taste of whiskey. It's such bullshit. And kids don't lie, right? Um, well, they do, okay, but they're, they're honest, okay? You can ask a child to taste something, they'll tell you if it tastes nice or not, right? If I got the, that advertising, uh, highly paid advertising team, right? Here you go, lads, we have a meeting, 8 a.m., into the meeting, there you go. You all have a, a, a glass of this whiskey. I'm not going to say the name of it. You all have, like, you know, a quadruple there. We have a camera on you here now. Okay, and we have some, like, I don't know, taste scientists. Get Brian Hingis in. He'll he, he give you some, some reaction. But, and I've seen stuff in this before. Film their faces, knock back a pint of whiskey. Let's see what their, their faces, or not a pint, well, even a, a, a double of whiskey. Let's see what their faces say. And even the hardest whiskey drinkers, they knock back a pint they're making a face and they're putting it down. And the, the face is there for a reason. It's 40% alcohol. So all the other 60% is all about masking that taste. And 100%, some whiskeys won't be as harsh as others due to the refinement and what have you. But they still have that 40% alcohol and that's what you're trying to mask. And it just doesn't taste good. And your body, the face you're making it is just your body, your brain, your nervous system, it's like trying to reject, it's trying to like, hey, this isn't good. That's the message it's saying by taste, right? Um, so it doesn't taste good. But we have come to the, we have arrived, you know, uh, at this point in our, in our history, if you like, of drinking alcohol, that you can put that up and, and people walk by it. Taste, that's why, for, about whiskey. Like, it's it's just, it's remarkable. Um and I almost, you almost have to stand back in awe and, and look at this, right? And I see, and I've, stand, I've stood in off lights and you, you look down at all the different colored bottles and the money that goes into uh, designing the bottle, what color we use, what kind of font we we'll use, what's our brand going to be about. It's about this. And you, you'll hear these small little micro breweries who, you know, get their peat from and, and roast their whiskey this way or whatever the hell. Uh, it's, it's like... You know, at the end of the day, what is it? What's it taste like? And, and there's, there's, they have to be dishonest. And once, once, someone told me once, avoid foods that are uh, overly advertised. All right, um, you probably never saw an ad for a carrot or or a potato, okay, or even meats. You know, but um, the high processed food, they need to advertise that your 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 cokes, your your. Uh, Mars bars, your confectionery, all of that kind of stuff. They pump in the ads to that. It, it's highly processed stuff. They need to advertise it. You know, you don't need to advertise the rest of the stuff. So they need to advertise al alcohol. And the result is more more consumption, more consumption, more consumption. And it's going up and up. And, and it's just, I find it interesting. And yeah, as I mentioned before, like just my whole experience about it now, it's like the, uh, it's like an illusion. It's like, you know, the, the magician's son is, uh, pretty assistant in half you know I've seen into the box I've seen behind the curtain and, and that that's my experience of it now but I needed to go you know close to a year alcohol free to really appreciate that you know because it was so so much uh, a, an ingrained habit uh, something I didn't even question you know and people think people think hey that's a big sacrifice you're making there Okay, and if you're thinking about it now, if I told you, could you give up alcohol for the next three months, six months, nine nine months, a year? Does that sound like an, a sacrifice to you? Like you can answer that, because I was a bit kind of, I was kind of excited about the challenge. Um, in terms of a sacrifice, I'm sacrificing nothing. If I went back drinking regularly, then I'm sacrificing. I'm getting that little bit of high, little bit of a high, followed by the low, which is guaranteed with, with a lot of drugs, okay, including alcohol. 
Um, I'm sacrificing my Sunday morning that I, I train. I'm sacrificing a good night's sleep. I'm sacrificing being more patient with my kids. I'm sacrificing my health, my hydration levels, whatever. Uh, and I just don't feel the need to. And again, I didn't do this plan to give up alcohol forever. But what it has done, it, it's I've changed my relationship with alcohol. And yeah, now I see it for what I believe it is. And I think I have a, I have a more, I have a fair, uh, I can I can give alcohol, I can judge alcohol, if you like, reasonably well, now that I'm not in the throes of drinking it on a regular basis, now that um, I've lived, and I'm not talking about, like I mentioned before, hiding away in, in November, I've lived alcohol-free for a long time. Uh, and I, I, it's it's been massively, massively beneficial, and it's, it's literally changing my life going forward. You know, um, so let's repeat the question. I'm going to wrap up here, guys, because I think I have said pretty much all I want to say on it. Okay, I could probably talk a little bit more on it. For for example, I have a few more stats there. There, like the average Irish person drinks forty bottles of vodka a year. Do you not? The equivalent in alcohol content. Think about that. 40 bottles of vodka a year. Good God. I, I, I was surprised at that. I know people who drink more, by the way. I'm sure you do too. Um, peer pressure. Yeah, let, let's talk about that there briefly. I mentioned to you before, my mates were like, cool. They were surprised. A couple of them were like, you what? You're, what, you're giving up alcohol? Um, no, no, just not drinking at the moment. Not giving up completely. Okay. They were cool, okay? Um, but I've definitely witnessed... I've been places where, go on, have a drink, have a drink. And, you know, what was that stat? 76.5% of men over 40 who have committed suicide had a history of alcohol abuse. Within that 76.5% of people, okay, who, who have sadly passed away. I'm sure there was times that some of them must have tried to give it up, okay? And they were probably pressured, go on, have a drink. Have a drink. Maybe they didn't get the right support. Have a drink. Ah, go on. Ah, oh, no, I'm off. I'm off. Go on, have a drink for fuck's sake. You know, that's the kind of language that you hear. Um, and maybe they caved. Who knows? But it's interesting that we, so it's, it's, exact, it, that's accepted. You know, that's accepted to put pressure on someone to consume a drug that has all of those uh, downsides that I mentioned. You know, I'm, who knows? We don't know. That's one thing with regards to mental health, you know, knowing whether someone's in a dark place or not, that we just don't, you just don't know. You can't tell by looking by at someone, okay? And there's been some high profile su suicides o over the, the last few years I can think of. Um, I don't know whether they're alcohol related or not, but you, you just don't know. So maybe that's something we need to look at, peer pressuring people, okay? Uh, again, it wasn't an issue for me, but I know from one year no beer, that's an issue for a lot of people. And maybe it would have been an issue for me when I was younger. But it actually says more about the people who are pressuring that person to drink because maybe they don't feel comfortable being in their presence if they're sober because they want to drink. You know, this is, you know, you're talking about drinking buddies. Um, and I've seen it from working in bars. You know, like I've seen proper alcoholics, as in, I don't want to say proper alcoholics, alcoholism isn't black and white, right? There is 50 shades of grey, if you, if you like, right? There are functional alcoholics, there are, there are unfunctional alcoholics, there are people who have just, they're just, you know, haven't been sober in years. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's bloody, it's a disease that is, uh, that is rampant and it ruins lives and not just the life of the alcoholic. Um, I've seen in bars, though, where I opened a hotel. I opened up our, our hotel bar. I, I was opening up and getting everything ready. And someone came in. They, they ordered a pint, and he was with his with his mate. There was a few of them, and his mate, oh no, I'm not. It's only whatever, early in the morning, you know. Um, and just a look in his face, and I I knew this guy from the bar. You know, he, he was a regular. And this is like twenty years ago. So, um, but he was pressuring his mate, have a drink. What do you what? What do you mean you're not having a drink? He's like, it's half 11 in the morning, Jim, whatever his name was. I'm not having a drink, I don't want one. But I could see this guy pressure him. I knew that guy. I just knew how quick and how much he drank. 
and he's kind of doing that because he feels a little bit bad drinking himself. So maybe that's something that that needs needs to be looked at, needs to be considered. Um, the last thing I want to mention, right, um, is the memes. Okay, and I'm not sure there's there's a, there's a proper term for this, but if you want to buy, for example, a a particular brand of let's say car, let's say you're looking at buying yourself a golf. GTI or something all right, and you just decide that all of a sudden you're going to notice all the golf GTIs that drive by you you might even think hey they're everywhere but they're not you, you're just paying attention and you're more observant to them now and that's kind of what I what I mentioned about the advertising I'm more observant to this now that I'm paying attention to them more but something that you see a lot is the is the the memes okay and there, there was a girl that uh, was in I'm not sure if I saw her from One Year No Beer or whatever, but she she has an Instagram page. I think it's uh, Tell Better Stories. I don't follow her, but I was looking her up there because she made some excellent points about the, what she refers to as the, the mommy wine culture. Um, and every, most days, I've, I've noticed it and it's like, there's a glass of wine and it's like, there's a marking on it, about a quarter way up, it's good day. Halfway up, it's, bad day full you know full glass of wine don't even ask and there's all all this talk about you know schooling at homeschooling and wine and, and yoga and wine and all this kind of stuff but basically what they're saying is listen if you're a single mother you know alcoholism is is ex understandable you know because how, how could you possibly cope with like a screaming kid without alcohol uh, but she makes some really valid points on it and all of a sudden when i see them i think differently I'm not going to lie, I would have the odd uh, laugh at it, but it's not at my expense. Again, there's vulnerable, don't say vulnerable, th this this affects a lot of people. Um, and, you know, I, 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 like a, I like a laugh, I like a joke. Um, but yeah, we, we kind of have to, kind of have to look at it a little bit differently, you know. Drink sensibly. A drug that when you drink makes you act anything but sensibly drink sensibly you know it, it's just it's a strange one but yeah again i'm going to leave it there if anybody's interested i would repeat these questions why do you drink ask yourself that does alcohol enhance your life ask yourself that how long have you lived as an adult alcohol free there's the first three questions all right so if you answer them, you kind of, well, I've lived a year alcohol-free, I know, and I've now lived with it. So you'd be able to answer. If you haven't lived alcohol-free for any decent amount of time, can you answer the first to, can you answer whether alcohol enhances your life or not if you don't know? Because that's like coming from a, 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 a place where you don't have experience, you know? Um, and one other question I asked was like, did I decide that alcohol was going to be this part of my life? And I didn't. I just went, fell into it as a teenager. So, so that's that. That's it, guys. I barely have a drink anymore. Um, I found it massively beneficial. It is definitely counter culture. And I'm going against our culture, uh, and I think a huge amount of people will be massively surprised and delighted if they tried this journey. All right. So I'm going to leave it there. Thanks for listening. Cheers. Thanks very much for listening, guys. If you want to find out any more information, you can contact us on Instagram at Rob underscore Movement 101 or you can contact Brian at Brian underscore Movement 101. Thanks very much again. See you next time.